How about eggs, right? People say, well, why don't you eat eggs? I mean, you're not killing the chicken, the chicken produces eggs, and the egg is not like a living sentient being. What's your problem with that? Well, here's part of the problem, is that when, when we see the word cage-free, that just means that the hens aren't in cages. They could be in massive sheds that have problems with uh, ventilation, and also the hens, uh, they're very uncomfortable being in confined areas, even if they're not in a cage. They do beak trimming, which I talked about, and they all come from hatcheries. And once the egg production wanes, the hens are killed. And just to let you know, they can't take hens and turn them into a uh, chicken to eat. Uh, broiler chickens and, hen and, and uh, laying hens are two different um, animals. So when the laying hens are spent, when they're done, they're just slaughtered and they're thrown away. You can't eat them. It's just by the law. Um, now, uh, I want to show you just something quickly, and, and this is the part you might not want to watch. It's only about seven seconds. But people, so I've, I've thought about this myself, you know, before. I was like, I just, I like eggs, and I, I want to eat eggs. They taste great. But, so what's wrong with just going to the store? Like, in Chico, there's a place where I can go buy hens, and I can just keep them in my yard and eat the eggs. So what's the harm there, Mr. Vegan, why are you, what's your problem? So then I, I, so I thought about it and I read a little bit about it and then it turns out that I discovered something that makes perfect sense, right? So just follow the trail back for a second. So you go to the store over there in Chico and I get the hen, I go, where did that hen come from? How do they produce hens? Well, hens hatch from eggs. So there have to be these places called hatcheries. And there are, right? There, is, there are places in California that produce hundreds of thousands of eggs a day. Now, think about this for a second. When a hen um, lays an egg, what is the probability that egg will be a male? 0.5, correct. So there's a 50% chance it'll be male and a 50% chance it'll be female. But male chickens, AKA roosters, they don't lay eggs. So they're not valuable. So 50% of the eggs that are laid, when they hatch, they go, oh, that's a male chick, that's a female chick. The female chick is a commodity. That, that chick can produce eggs. The male, the rooster is not a commodity. So half of the eggs that are hatched are male, and we can't keep a bunch of roosters for no good reason. So what we do is we just throw them into grinders. So half, so half of all the eggs that are hatched, they're thrown into grinders. Now, this is, this is a little bit disturbing, but this is, this is how eggs are produced. This is a byproduct of egg production. So these are chicks. That's what happens to chicks. They're just thrown into a macerator. So this is how we have suffering. You know, the cows and steer, they're separated at birth, they're dehorned, and they're branded, and then they're taken to slaughter. Pigs are castrated, as I mentioned, ears notched, nose ring uh, piercings. Okay, so now I want to talk a little bit about humane slaughter. Because you think, okay, well, they're slaughtered humanely, but here's the, the truth of the matter is that even if you have an idyllic farm where you raise the pig and it's happy every day of its life, most, vast majority of locavore, humanely raised pigs are slaughtered at the same slaughtering plant that the factory farm pigs are. They just ship them off and then they're slaughtered. Now, quickly, let me just go through this. This is the Animal Welfare Act. This is something interesting I want to show you. The word animal, for, me, for the purposes of the Animal Welfare Act, it says this term excludes birds, rats of the genus ratus, mice of the genus mus, bred for and used in research, hor horses not used for research purposes, and other farm animals such as but not limited to livestock or poultry. So just to let you know, the United States Animal Welfare Act, which was put into, um, uh, it was passed through legislation to protect animals from cruelty, does not cover livestock. There's the legislation, doesn't cover livestock. Now there are, state, there are state mandates that cover the treatment of livestock, but there's no federal mandate. You can, there's no federal mandate on how you treat livestock. There's also something called the Humane Slaughter Act, and notice it says, Cattle, calves, horses, mules, sheep, swine, and other livestock. Well, guess what? Chickens are not livestock. 
chickens are not covered by the Humane Slaughter Act. Chickens can be slaughtered in, a vari in any number of ways, and they are. And as we saw, there are 9 billion chickens in the country, 40 billion chickens on the planet uh, slaughtered every year. So in the United States, they're not really, there's not much protection for chickens. So even if you have, hum even if you have chickens that are grown in, at polyface farms and Michael Pollan comes and gives his blessing, they're slaughtered in a way that causes them pain and suffering. Um, and here's a little article from the Washington Post from 15, six, 14 years ago where they interviewed a slaughterhouse worker and he says that oftentimes the animals are still conscious while they're slaughtered and while they're skinned, while they're taken apart. So slaughter is a part of humane meat. So here you can see the animal, right? It, it, the eye is blinking as it's going through slaughter. Okay. Okay, I think I laid that out. Let me get to something about veganism. I'm going to argue now for, for veganism, and I'm going to talk about basically um, the difference uh, quickly. Vegetarianism is a view, is a, is a practice where you eat, you, you can't, it's a, it's a little more liberal, so you can eat, you can be like a lacto-vegetarian or lacto-ovo, which means you can eat dairy products or eggs and dairy products. But veganism is pretty much saying something like, um, you know, you can't eat any animal products or wear any animal products. Um, and there's, in general, let me just give you, there's like three arguments for vegetarianism or veganism. One is the environmental argument. And that argument says that the food, animal production is terrible for the environment. And it is, and, and you can look this up. There's a, 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 a UN study from 2007 called Livestock's Long Shadow in which it's demonstrated that at least 18% of uh, global greenhouse gas emissions come from the animal production, production industry. That's greater than all the cars, trains, and planes added up. And there's also an argument for personal health. People say it's healthy to be a vegan, eat vegetables. I'm not going to give either of those arguments. I'm just going to focus on one argument. My argument is what's called the ethical argument for veganism. I'm going to argue that it's morally, um, we're, we're, we're morally um, obligated in Fresno to be vegan, in Chico too, but in this area we have. We have. So there's, there's what I'm going to argue. So, um, so if you're a vegan, you don't eat food stuffs that are derived from animal products, including dairy and eggs. And you don't use products derived from animals like leather because leather is the byproduct of the dairy and meat industry. Just before we go on, I just want to lay something out there. This is the American Dietetic Association's position paper on vegan diets. I just want you to see, because I'm not a nutritionist, so I'm just relying on them. If you have a disagreement, you can talk to the American Dietetic Association. It is the position of the American Dietetic Association that approximately, that uh, appropriately plan vegetarian diets, including total vegetarian or vegan diets, are healthful, nutritionally adequate, and may provide health benefits in the prevention and treatment of certain diseases. Well-planned vegetarian diets are appropriate for individuals during all stages of life cycle, including pregnancy, lactation, infancy, and childhood and adolescence, and for athletes. So... What about protein? Well, here's the position paper of the same organization, and they say, plant protein can meet protein requirements when a variety of plant foods is consumed and energy needs are met. Research indicates that an assortment of plant foods eaten over the course of a day can provide all of the essential amino acids and ensure adequate nitrogen retention and use in healthy adults. Thus, complementary proteins do not need to be consumed at the same meal. So, so I just want to set those two things aside protein and whether or not veganism is healthy for you. So, so no, we can talk about it, but I don't really have it. I'm not a doctor. So. Um, now, I want to give you, what I want to do is I want to give you an argument now for veganism. I'm interested in the problem of hierarchical, systemic, speciesist human violence perpetrated against non-human animals and the role that veganism can play in the solution to this violence. So here's my argument for veganism. And you'll see why I went through what I just went through. The first premise, I think it's non-controversial, really. It says it's wrong to cause suffering and or premature death unless there is good enough reason. 
So what would be an example of good enough reason to cause suffering? Well, here's an example. Like, um, you take your little brother or sister to the pediatrician, and the doctor has to give her a, a shot, and it's going to hurt and cause suffering, but if she doesn't get the shot, she might get sick really badly. And so you say, well, that's a good enough reason to cause suffering in my kid or something like that. So that would be an example of good enough. Um, what's not good enough reason? Uh, you take your little kid to the pediatrician, and your pediatrician says, there's nothing wrong with your kid, but I just like to give injections to kids because I like how they grimace. And that would be not good enough reason, right? So this premise just says it's wrong to cause suffering and death unless there's good enough reason. The second premise says our consumption of animal products uh, causes animal suffering and or premature death. Well, I think I just demonstrated that even humane meat and dairy causes unnecessary suffering and death. The industry itself is an industry that causes suffering and death. So I think that's not too controversial, but I'm going to come back to this later because I think, I think this is a, a point to talk about. With minimal hardship, if any, a vast majority of us California residents can flourish without consuming animal products. Now, I call this a localized argument for veganism because I'm not today standing here saying if you're an Inuit person and you live off of blubber that you cannot survive. And no, I'm just talking about in California right now in 2015. If we're living in a relatively you know, modern industrialized society, we have an obligation to be vegan. So, that's, so I'm not, this is not a universal claim that every human being on the planet has to be um, vegan. A vast majority of us California residents consume animal products not because they are physiologically or nutritionally necessary. That's why I showed you those slides from the American Dietetic Association. But because we desire to satisfy our taste preferences. We like the way it tastes. So for the most part, the reason why we consume animal products is because they taste good and because they're easily accessible and because there's they're part of our cultural tradition, right? So some people have like spaghetti and meatballs and some people have um, uh, uh, carnitas. And so there's a lot of reasons, but none of the reasons are that they're nutritionally or physiologically necessary. So you can see I'm just trying to build an argument that says it's wrong to cause unnecessary suffering and eating meat is not necessary. So I'm gonna, five is gonna follow. Satisfying our taste preferences is not good enough reason. So therefore, it's morally wrong to consume animal. That just follows if you buy one through five. And then my conclusion is, a vast majority of us California residents ought to stop consuming animal products. OK. Now, before we move on, let me just address some not uncommon reactions to veganism I have encountered many times and am happy to address in the Q&A. So I'm just going to go through these quickly. Other animals eat animals, so it must be natural and ethical for us to eat them. What about plants? Plants are alive. A shift of vegetarianism would entail more plant deaths. Native Americans prey to the animals after killing them, and they used every part. It isn't wrong for us to kill animals so long as we do so respectfully and don't waste any part of their body. If we ended animal agriculture, where would the land come from to grow all the new crops we need? If we ended animal agriculture, what would become of all the people in ag who would then be out of jobs? If we stopped eating meat, what would become of all the farm animals? I want to talk about veganism. And I want to talk about four kinds of veganism that I see. I call these four kinds identity veganism, boycott veganism, engaged veganism, and aspirational veganism. So you saw that my talk was called How Not to Be Vegan. So now I'm going to get to the nitty gritty of what I'm trying to argue. Not only am I trying to argue for veganism, I'm trying to argue for a particular kind of veganism. Um, and and I'm, I'm going to argue that. Uh, well, let me just argue it. 